Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Maloney. I'm with Imaginary Landscape. Uh, I'm here with, uh, with Joe, uh, who's the uh, lead developer for the organization. Um, I'm actually going to, it's going to be a two-part presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Joe shortly uh, to have him walk through the specifics of uh, and steps that he goes through for the code review and what markers he looks for. Uh, but I'm going to start first um, and spend a little time between when we are first contacted by a potential client and the code review uh, itself. There are, um, there are many interesting aspects to that space, as you'll see. After Joe's uh, presentation, then I'll come back with some final thoughts. So uh, I want to talk very briefly about why we're here. Um, Yesterday, Imaginary Landscape celebrated its 17th birthday, so we've been around for a while. We've been, uh, we made the internal decision to go with Python in around 1999, and we've been coding websites since that in, uh, in Python. We've had several frameworks and environments and made the switch to Django in about 2006. Even though we've been a very strong supporter of the open source and Python community, we were, our public face was that of, of just a web developer. As you can see, this is our public site, smiling, happy, beautiful people. All the ways we can solve business problems, not one mention of, uh, of Django. So a couple years ago, we made the decision to uh, transition to uh, Django only. Um, and we went all in with it. So we did so in a very public way, um, as you can see. And as a consequence, we've had more Django-specific inbound inquiries. Here's our Django site, specific site. And as you can see, it's very Django-centric. Allows, allows us to get our geek on pretty strong about Django and go really deep. Um, and so this sort of public-facing uh, Django positioning has led to a, a, a lot more people calling into us not because we're a web developer, but because we uh, are a Django consultancy and they need some help. So why do they call? Um, they call for a couple reasons. Uh, the first one is that their in-house staff can't handle the load. Maybe they have a, a project that bursts up and they need some helping hands, or they've lost someone in staff. Unfortunately, we see far too many of this which is their existing developer has become what they would characterize as slow or uh, unresponsive. Sometimes that relationship is amicable in the case of the former. Often it's not in the case of the latter. Regardless of the underlying cause, uh, the pain remains the same for those who call us, and that is we, we can't get our stuff done. We can't get uh, the work done that we need to get done on the website. So when they call in, I, I typically feel those calls initially, and they represent a wide array of scenarios, um, different combinations of, of caller, different situations and, um, and need. Um, the person who calls in may or may not have any technical knowledge whatsoever, which is, uh, is an important distinction um, as we move forward. So we immediately begin to, uh, to triage uh, and to determine uh, on the front end what the situation is that they're uh, encountering. And that starts with very clearly, tell me where it hurts. And uh, 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 that description of, of pain can shed a lot of light into the situation. The other thing that we do is we give a sense of pricing. Um, we need to get out in front of that question before the end of the first call. But for that question, you can do a lot of work for nothing in, uh, in our role. Um, these are our rates. This is, what you can, you know, this is what you can expect to pay. And sometimes you get uh, interesting responses. Sometimes, gee, Jesus, you know, I'm not looking for a, I'm looking for a goddamn program, I'm not a freaking neurosurgeon. <laughs> well, I've just saved a lot of time. And, uh, and so it's, in, it's important that you get in, in front of that and you do so in a, in a very professional way. This, these are our rates. This is what you can expect to pay. A 
assuming that they have an aneurysmed out by this point, we continue on with the call, and we try and find out a little bit about uh, the situation. Again, this is before the code review, the, before, before the technical review starts. This is the pre-triage. Do you know anything about where the site is hosted? Um, do you know if the code is in a repository? I swear to God, about one in, time, one in 10 times, like, no, I said repository. Um, one of the things that's really important is uh, how accessible is the current developer? Whether or not we might need access to that current developer is somewhat irrelevant, but whether or not that current developer is accessible is important. So we go through this preliminary um, set of questions and we find out a lot. And what we find out is that you don't need to be a programmer, because I'm not a programmer, to get a feel for you know, where on the continuum this site might fall. First thing we do is request access, okay? So don't worry about reading this. There'll be a, a URL at the end of the presentation where this document and the others referenced in this presentation will be available for download. Um, so the first thing we need to do is take a look under the hood, see what we're dealing with to prep, to prep Joe and his team for the code review. Um, so just real quickly, you know, uh, the live site, we need the login to the Django ad. Uh, admin, preferably super user, shell access, um, login credentials, read only is preferred, direct relocations for some of uh, the more important areas. If you happen to have a development site, fabulous, give us for that too. God forbid you actually also have a staging site as well, give us for that as well. Where's your repository? Where does its, um, where is its location? If it's in GitHub, make us a collaborator and, and such and then you test those. Because I think about 50% of the time when we get credentials sent to us, they're wrong. And there's nothing that Joe likes better than sitting down with a nice cup of coffee to do a code review and flaming out in like 15 seconds because the first login fails. Uh, so we go and we test it and make sure that it works. Okay, so armed with all this information, uh, and it's now teed up, and what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Joe, and Joe's gonna walk you through the actual uh, uh, sausage making of the uh, code review. So when you first get this access, uh, where do you begin? And that's uh, with the code review. And why are some of the reasons we do this? Um, first of all, to standardize the, the questions that we ask each client, and, and this obviously gives us a way to compare clients to clients. Um, provides us an initial place to document anything we find out about uh, the client, um, because there's nothing worse than coming back to it later and having to relearn the same stuff we did before. Um, we get to see what new technologies different developers are using. It might give us some uh, interesting idea of uh, something we could be using ourselves. And it just, mainly it gives us a sense of what kind of effort is involved in getting these clients on board. Uh, first, when I sit down, I, I do a general, I get a general sense of the code, and a big thing is actually finding the code on the file system. Uh, sometimes the client doesn't know where, uh, where the code is, they, they had a developer working on it, and um, just finding the code is, um, is, is troublesome sometimes, but obviously they, sometimes they put them in uh, logical places like home or, in, uh, or web or something like the www, but, uh, uh, I take note of special or important directories like uh, configuration directories, where are the, the Apache or Nginx files. Um, I look for the manage.py and settings.py files to see where the Django project is actually hosted. And then typically I try to get a feel if they're using a, a, a sort of settings framework like uh, local settings or a local settings directory uh, to see where to start looking for the configurations. And finally, I'll get a sense of what the URL structure looks like for the, for the app, uh, and what and what modules or what submodules look like with their URLs. We have a, a basic checklist. It's a Google Doc that we use, and we clone for e each time we do this. And this helps uh, just ask these standard questions, so we can uh, uh, evaluate with an open mind. Um, First question we ask is, um, 
uh, list any services that uh, the site appears to, to use. And that's just a generic question. Are they using, or what kind of web server are they using? Are they using Nginx, Apache? I see mostly Nginx and Apache lately. Um, and um, are the, what, what version of Django are they using? Can we determine that? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not easy to determine that if you don't have access to their code base or if you don't have access to their servers. Um, settings.py, I'll take a look at, see what, uh, what's in the installed apps. Um, see if they're using any sort of database, any sort, or of course they're using a database, but using any sort of caching, no SQL, um, any sort of APIs that would be worth noting. And, um, and I'll make excessive notes of this um, in that document, so I'll be able to uh, uh, get a quick sense of things. One thing that I, you know, can't stress enough is, you know, you're working in someone else's environment. You know, it's, it's good to have a, a read-only presence. You know, tread lightly in someone else's place, and uh, um, and while you still learn this, inf while you still learn how to um, access this, but um, one thing I'll do often is activate the virtual environment and do a pip freeze to get an idea of what packages are installed. Um, I'll do a, a PS listing just to get uh, to see what processes are running, Django, Nginx, um, Supervisor. Um, is there an application user that they're using for, um, uh, running, for running their code? Um, that's important, especially um, if you take a look at the cron tab, you can look at the global cron tab, but there's also an application user cron tab. So um, uh, looking at the cron tab will help you identify if they're running any out of band processes or management commands. And then it's just a good idea to get a general sense of the Django admin uh, to see if that will help you understand what the site is doing. The next question we ask is, what kind of version control are they using? You know, get material, subver or, subver or, uh, subversion. Um, I even saw one client using Dropbox. And um, this is uh, obviously important to see. Um, so you can know how you can integrate your processes into them. Uh, I saw one time a client using both get and subversion and it was hard to know exactly, it was just like, there's a .git directory and a .svn, direct, .svn directories out there, and it's, um, it was kind of in a, an awkward state. So just knowing that helps determine how difficult it is to, gonna be to, uh, to migrate the code. Um, are they using the version control? That's another question. Like sometimes you just see a production site they have a get directory, but there's nothing committed into it, or there's like a lot of um, uncommitted files in the production directory, and um, that's gonna give you also an idea if, there, if there's gonna be some trouble migrating. Um, if, they're, if they are using it, are they doing something more than just basic usage? You might be able to get an idea if they're using some sort, or using git flow, or using some sort of um, process that you can kind of emulate and hook into when you're, when you're doing it too. Uh, the third question is a set of checklists that we go through. Just basically yes, no questions, and if it's a no, we put some comments by it. Um, are they using a requirements file? And this is, um, this is pretty important to me to see if they're using a requirements file, because <coughs> even a minor version can really mess things up if you're not aware of it. And um, again, you can kind of get a, an idea of um, what the requirements are if you do a, a pip freeze. Uh, but that will also list any other packages that they've installed that may, they may or may not be using. And um, uh, if you don't have access to their original environment, and you just, you are, uh, if you don't have access to that original environment, there might be some issues trying to determine what versions you should be using. For example, uh, one time we had a, an issue recently with um, an upgrade from Django 1. Uh, well, we installed the newest version of Django 1.2, um, and uh, the client was using apparently a version lower than 1.2.4, so there was that CSRF JavaScript change that um, was difficult to see that, uh, that they hadn't implemented yet. And uh, so even a little version can make, it, make a difference. Um, are they using Django tests? Just, this just helps uh, get an idea of uh, what kind of development was already in place where they see the important, um, the important parts of their application. Are they using south for migrations? Um, it's very difficult 
self is you know is a great tool. It's very difficult to to migrate any anything without self without doing like direct alters. So that would be a good indicator to us um, how much effort it is going to be to make changes once we actually get the code up and running. Is there evidence of virtual environment? Usually it's pretty obvious to see this, but there's been a lot of cases where we I've seen uh, you know servers just running a Django instance on a server alone and um, no virtual environment, and it really makes it hard to isolate where all the code is, so um, that's an unfortunate thing that still is out there is people are not using that too much. I mean, people are using it plenty, but there's still clients out that are not. That are not. Um, is the configuration separate from the code? And I, I personally think that you know, there should be no hard coding values in settings.py, it should always be split out into some mechanism that could be a local settings py or it could be like a second settings directory. So um, that's an important thing to check for. Are they using Fabric um, for configuration? Um, that, that will help determine if they've got some setup steps or um, restart steps that you can take advantage of and it helps, helps in uh, your understanding of the code. Are they using Django logging, logging or static files? Um, I really like to see um, Django logging because that really helps um, helps us debug when there's problems, and it's, if it's already, if people are already using it, it makes it all easier to uh, migrate and take a look at. Static files, um, the new static files as of 1.3 is a really cool addition in my opinion, and, uh, and it's, it really makes help, manage, help managing that a lot better, and um, uh, seeing that someone else is using that is, uh, um, is useful to, to know that we can easily manage the static files with that application. Uh, another thing we do is, um, on a scale of one to 10, we ask how well is, is the application documented? And first of all, is there a readme? And all too many times there's not a readme, and it really is a nice place to start if you see a readme and you can um, use that as, a, as a, uh, a good starting point. Even if the readme just says, run this Fabric script um, to install, but, um, I think it's important to keep that README up to date and easily, t easily accessible. Is there inline, inline documentation within the code? And um, not too many people seem to do this in, in the reviews that I've done. There's uh, um, just lines of code with uh, nothing. To, I mean, I don't think it may not be necessary to um, document every little single thing, but at least where there are confusion points, I think it's uh, very useful to throw in documentation there. Does the client have some sort of online documentation source, like a track documentation, or um, some somewhere that you can ask them uh, where we can find more addition or more information? And um, another place to look is the uh, the version history if they're using version control. And then you should document yourself as much as possible where to find this, these sources of information. Another thing we rate on a scale of one to 10 is, it's just an overall sanity check, can we work with this? And um, you know, this is a good thing to help us uh, give an idea of effort needed, and, um, and probably, um, chances are we can work with it, but a lower score will obviously mean we have to put a lot more work into getting, up, getting it up and running and getting it migrated to a, uh, to a new environment. And uh, um, then another thing we'll want to keep an eye on is, is there going to be any possible onboarding issues? And an issue just means, uh, is there some, some service or um, application that we're gonna have to uh, put a little bit extra effort in? Is, is there an, a new API that we're not familiar with? Um, these are things that we'll want to, to document and it will help, help us communicate to the client uh, what kind of effort we're gonna need to put into it. Um, it will also help us anticipate problems with the migration, so um, it's a good thing to be aware of um, if there's any, any unknowns. And finally, um, during the whole code review process, um, just take notes excessively. Um, key, uh, like note any random thoughts that you have that you haven't documented previously. You know, it really does help when you take a look at it in the future. Now, I've seen a lot of code that's kind of uh, that's good code and, and some not so good code. Um, 
some things that I've seen is um, some, these are some actual comments from some of the uh, reviews. Like all the files are owned by root. Um, I think that uh, files should be pretty much owned by an application user or at least tightened down. Um, upload directory had um, 777 permissions. Um, just little annoying things that, you know, that I think should be tightened down a little bit more tight. Some Python, JavaScript, and H HTML files were marked as ex executable. Um, these are all kind of related to, um, you know, having just basic permissions not set correctly. Um, one thing that I saw in one particular review is that it, all of the views had import statements inside the view functions. And um, there was uh, one case where I saw like um, the whole application not segmenting their models and their applications very well. All the models were in one models.py, like about 50 of them at the top level of the, uh, of the Django project. One, one case I saw there's um, interesting like temporary lock files in, um, in the web directory and, I, and these looked like Dreamweaver lock files, just random things that didn't belong there. Um, or um, there were some cases where the models.py was returning um, actual markup and uh, email templates information, things that should be split out into separate modules. So as a reviewer, um, it's always good to keep an open mind. Um, you will want to determine if something was done for a reason. Uh, it may not be obvious uh, why something is done a certain way, but uh, for example, I saw an instance where uh, a model was being saved without any, any update being, being made to it. And I was going, like, why would someone be making this change, be making this save? There was nothing, nothing going on here. But then looking deeper, that save was actually um, an, or calling a signal which was sending out an email. It may have looked a little weird to me and may not have been necessary, but changing it would alter the code. So keeping an open mind helps um, kind of get into the head of who is developing it and lets you take their position a little bit. It's good to research the client a little bit, um, check them out online to see, um, uh, see what their site looks like, see what their business is, so that, that can help, like, help um, give you an understanding of what their business is. And um, uh, then, uh, again, document, document, document as you review. And as a coder who wants to make good code for other people to review. It's good to follow basic Python principles and Django principles. Thankfully, Django is, uh, has a relatively a nice layout, so you can go into a Django application and, and see where all the major components are. Uh, but um, it's still important, in my opinion, to keep, uh, keep things as consistent and following standards as much as possible. Um, Make documentation easy to find. So um, again, put a README in there or other types of instructional documentations. Define a configuration strategy. Um, you know, make it so um, it's easy for people to um, create a con configuration file if they check out their you know, check out your code on their desktop machine or or on some other server. It sh you should be able to easily replace a settings file or uh, and get things up and running. You know, work towards a one-step deployment. Um, that kind of falls in line with the last, last bullet point. Um, the easier it is for, uh, for you to deploy your code, it just has benefits all around. Um, um, you should have uh, easy access to project dependencies. And um, that's um, often too many times I'll see just random dependencies uh, linking to fork versions of Django or fork versions of Haystack. And that just makes it all more difficult to find exactly what, what uh, dependency is needed for this project. So it's good to keep on uh, major release or keep using dependencies on major releases, maintain your requirements file. If you need to uh, bundle a, a bunch of uh, some applications with your project, uh, it's better than uh, not having any links to them at all and just assuming that uh, people will know what to do with them. Uh, and use maintained packages if possible. Um, obviously, your, your needs will dictate, but, uh, dictate what will be needed, but uh, using main, maintained packages will help with just, um, they get more commits and, 
and uh, will will likely be easier to integrate and uh, uh, just have you know more uh, just be easier to integrate. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the, the floor back off to Brian. Um, okay, so as we as we sort of wind wind up, I want to give a couple a uh, couple thoughts, some, some more global thoughts, um, and share with you some of the some of the roadblocks that we've run into over time. Uh, assume your code will outlast the sun going nova. Um, no matter uh, how trivial the task or how transient you've been made to believe what you're doing is, code it like it will last forever. Uh, I can't actually tell you how many <laughs> sites and applications that, uh, that we've been rushed and, and sort of bullied into build because it would only last two weeks. I need it done now, it's, it's a very short time, only for two weeks, come on. Uh, and, and so we're trying to be accommodating to the client, right? Yeah, well, okay, speed, we'll, we'll go with speed. So, and you know, those two week things are still live and kicking five years later. And the guy, who, who asked you for it is on to his third job by now, right? So two bosses later takes a look at it and his eyes glaze over and he's like, holy, you know, this is a complete steaming pile. And you're like, yeah, but we were being responsive to the guy, two bosses, you know, in your position two times ago and, and we were being really great and he gets that kind of dead stare. Um, and, and I've been stared at with that stare and, and, it's, and it's unpleasant. Um, so, Code everything like it's going to last forever. Code as though the members of the Django core development team will be reviewing. You know, these, they all work for a living too, and, and what comes around goes around. And uh, you know, we see a lot of stuff. A lot of people can see a lot of stuff. Stuff that you may not intend or believe is going to be visible. Um, Resist the, the pull for speed uh, from, your, from your boss, from your client. It, it really is something that can never be satisfied. I, um, I'll admit to being uh, uh, one of those guys. I've had this conversation with Joe before. Uh, I may have it tomorrow. I may even have it this afternoon. Yeah, I know what we talked about in the presentation, but I really need something done fast. Uh, and he'll, he knows me well enough to politely say, yes, okay, I'll do it fast. And he'll go through the same process that he goes through to do it well. Um, There's a great deal of power in no. It's no, no can be kind of scary because no can mean uh, you're, um, you may be walking away from an opportunity for, for money. Um, it's sometimes hard to say, uh, uh, to say no to power as well, but there is your own power in no and there is clarity in no. It, that can't be done. I can't do that for you. Uh, it's, it is something that is, um, one of the best things you can become comfortable with uh, to, to just say, no, this is the way I do things and what you're asking for isn't that way. Exercise your right to say no. You're a professional, right? So, uh, so act accordingly. I don't know how many times, I didn't actually uh, count how many times Joe said uh, document and documentation and write and, but he said it a lot. So uh, I get that the sizzle is, is going through and solving the, the problems, um, but you're a professional, and being a professional means you have to take the time to write it down with the README, with the requirements, with, um, with inline code. This is one of the biggest failings here, and it has really nothing to do with programming. Return the call, return the email. Even if there is nothing to report, even if the the uh, news is bad, there is no situ nature abhors a vacuum, right? There is no situation you can gracefully recover from if you go silent. However, there is almost no situation you can't recover from if you stay communicative. Return the call, even if there's nothing to report, even if the news is bad, because that's that's the professional way to, uh, to act. So uh, take the time and effort to be great at, at what you do. Because um, here's the thing, 
bad coders hurt good coders, right? I've had a lot of conversations on the phone, right? Uh, yeah, because of our prior experience, we're a little gun shy. So uh, they don't even know me, and, they, and, they, uh, and they're skeptical, and they don't trust me that much because of their prior experience. And, and, and now I'm in a defensive position. I, no, I, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm not an asshole. My, my kids love me, you know? And, and so all of a sudden, now I, now I got a guy coming at me with a package on, and, and he doesn't even know me yet. This makes my job harder. It makes the next coder's job harder. Bad coders hurt good coders. Similarly, bad code hurts Django. Now, this isn't specific to Django, but as I said earlier, uh, the people who call in, they may not all be technical, right? So, uh, so likewise, I've had conversations like, yeah, so we went with this guy, and uh, now we're stuck with this Django thing. And it's a scenario where, for whatever reason, their bad experience, they've now transferred that and they believe that it's the framework's fault. And, and it's the, Django's an easy thing to blame. It, you know, it won't fight back. Um, but, the, but the other side of that coin is that if you code professionally and you do a, a, a great job, then it's going to reflect positively on the framework uh, as well. In the end, um, really, it's, uh, you have to decide what kind of a, of a professional you want to be. There's, there's really nothing that we've talked about that probably everyone uh, here didn't know uh, already. Um, maybe not the fact that, you're, uh, that your code will last until the sun goes nova, but, uh, but pretty much there's a lot of common sense here. But it is troubling the amount of inbound uh, code that we, that we review that is in a, a state of disarray with a, uh, a, a developer that has gone silent and a client that is uh, skeptical uh, about the entire process. It's your reputation uh, on the line ultimately um, and to decide what kind of a professional you wanna be, take the time to, uh, to be great. Um, Thank you very much. The, uh, the materials that we have listed here, including the PowerPoint, are available on, uh, at chicagodjango.com forward slash djangocon 2012. And we're available for questions now. Well, talk was majority how do you review the code? How do you actually approach refactoring some of the legacy code or client's code? I'm sorry. That I can't how do you approach the question of refactoring some of the old code from the client? N not reviewing it, but to actually rewrite portions of it. So uh, usually um, the way we approach it is we first move, move it over to a newer infrastructure. And then um, once we have that, um, once we make that move, we have a better understanding of the code base itself, and we can put it on more modern hardware. And then we can slowly work towards upgrading features as, as needed. Um, it's again something that um, something that you have to do that the client doesn't see too much of a, a front end benefit, but it's something that's uh, important to um, to communicate. And, and that's that's. What yeah, I mean, we. Um, this is one of what makes it somewhat more difficult in this conversation. It's the it's the onboarding or new client cover charge, which is okay. All right, we've we've looked at it and we can work with it, but there's some structural problems with it. So the first thing we need to do is move it into our sort of standardized environment, and that's going to take time, and that's going to cost some money. And uh, the end result is that the site operates pretty much the same as it operates now, which is a tough sale uh, when you're going right out of the box. But it is, it is the, the time that uh, um, 
you don't get into the trap of, of doing that. Well, all I need is just this little thing done real quick, and if you can do that, then we can talk about moving it on. Because if you start down that path, that's a, that's a slippery slope. So part of our conversation, part about the transfer over and consideration of, a, of our firm is like, this, if you want to work with us, this is, uh, this is our path. And, and, and otherwise, we'll respectfully have to say no. I'm uh, just curious whether you are interested in new clients who aren't already invested in Django, so they're not coming to you with anything broken or not working. They just have maybe already implemented something in a completely different language, and they've heard about Django, and they're excited about it, and so they come to you. What do you tell them? Love it. <laughs> Okay, so so now now that's a whole that's a whole other thing, and that makes life a, a little bit easier. That makes life a little bit more exciting, because um, we are uh, you know enthusiastic about the uh, uh, about the framework and about the language, and we've been doing it for a long time, and we've seen a lot of stuff over those years. So uh, we uh, and, and and what that means is that uh, at some point we're not going to have to um, necessarily dig too deeply in. Uh, and, and try and change things in an area that we don't know. We're, we're able to come to and say, this is what we can do. You know, this is this is the uh, Django that we can do to support it. If they come to us and say, okay, but that's great, but I still need someone to support this the the PHP or the or the things. And even though we might have some of that skill set in house, that's not what we do, and that's not where uh, we can be most uh, consistently great. And so we'll say, uh, no, we will, we will um, work on the Django side if you come to us, and we'll do things in Django, and we'll do great things. And, and we'll work to, to, um, to make it as seamless as possible, but we're not going to dig in. If, if you have an, another thing you're gonna and you need help there, you're going to need to find someone else. Do you ever uh, max out and say, this looks really good, we'll help you write the RFP, like get it into the right language so you can uh, get a good Django developer, but we can't do it just because we're running out of time. So, you know, yeah, do you yeah, refer? Sure, is sure. I mean, the production schedule is, is, is uh, an issue, but uh, here's the thing that we found, uh, and, and this is an often, often a concern, is, uh, and this is what I tell people, I said, yeah, um, how quickly can we turn around a project, you know, a small web project, you know, six to eight to 12 weeks is when we can do it. But here's the thing, we're not gonna hit that mark and here's the other thing, we're not gonna hit it and it's not gonna be because of us. Because in many instances, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of work on the client side when they, when they come to us that they're not thinking about or are not prepared about. And, uh, and so invariably, we, uh, we uh, have gaps um, at, of time when uh, um, that extends the, the deadlines out. Uh, to answer your question for you know for for larger projects, yeah, I mean we've uh, you know we're we're flexible in that sense, and and we've often we, we've often uh, said, dear God, let us help you write your RFP, because uh, you know you guys have seen RFPs, right? It's 17 pages of don't email me and don't call me, and anything you say to me, I'm going to have to say to everyone, and uh, under requirements, uh, we need a calendar system, you know, and and that's it, so. So um, I just want to understand why you standardize people. You say we're, we're not going to work on your stuff and we're not going to work in languages we don't understand. It's because you're trying to make sure that you don't have a whole bunch of unknowns and don't underbid and be late and make people upset. So you want to you have like a consistent, like this is what we're strong at. This is the hardware we work at. We won't have any like weird issues where we don't understand your configuration. So you, it's so that's the purpose is to yes, that, that's that's uh, keep it in your wheelhouse and not a, have big questions about how long it's going to take and underbid dramatically or sure because you know even at some point if you take if you take on the the, the role of developer or lead developer quicker than you want it to be the entire thing becomes yours you know and, and there's only there's only a, a shelf life uh, of uh, oh yeah you know well that's because it's the the other guy's code and uh, and we've done that before uh, and we've and we've said yeah we can do it we can we can take it on and uh, and remember you know the the 
client relations, the trust is lower, price sensitivity is high and trust is low at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Once you, um, once you move, move through that relationship, then price largely goes away and trust increases. Mm-hmm. But in the front end, the la- <laughs> yeah. for all of our checklists, for even that, we had, we had one uh, last week that, um, that blew up on us. And the, you know, the reason that it blew up is that it, they didn't have a requirements file, but we thought we, had a, we, thought we could we'd allocate for that, but it, it went crazy on us. And even though we did it on an hourly basis, mm-hmm. Um, you, you, that's, that's not a, you know, most people won't buy a, uh, you know, I don't really know how long it's going to take, mm-hmm. um, and it might take a really long yeah. time, so, this so is, do it. Yeah, you're great guys, and you could do anything, but on a business sense, you need to make money and understand what you're going to spend. And, and that, a yeah. lot, that has to do with the kind of professional you want to be. I mean, there are, yeah. there are professional neurosurgeons, right, and there are professional waiters, and we spent a lot of our early years kind of being a, a, a professional waiter of, we can do anything you want, we'll, we'll do what you want, we'll clean up your spill, we'll, we'll be great at it, and we'll defer to you. Uh-huh. And, what we're, and, that, and that increased a lot of uncertainty and bulliness, mm-hmm. and then we've moved over a little bit more I to I see the there are a couple of people behind me, so I want to ask another quick question. Somebody else said, once you get there, how do you refactor? And I wanted to mention two books and see if you uh, like those books or another book, um, Working with Legacy Code and object-oriented re-engineering patterns or refactoring patterns. Have you ever, do you use those books or have an opinion on another book about what's a good book to refactor legacy code? Uh, we use like, uh, like you're asking for using specific uh, books to refactor code. Uh, first, we basically just, um, the first part of the relationship is just to move the code over. The refactor would come later and that's based on just getting a general sense of what uh, what's out there with the Django community. Um, I haven't seen too many books that necessarily lay down uh, specifics with Django, uh, other than like the Django books and uh, like the Django book and uh, the documentation, but uh, it's just a matter of trying to get a sense of, of you know, what a good strategy is for laying out the code and, and then, uh, uh, you know, up- adapting as needed and trying to Fit, or trying to pick a dis- or make a decision on what you want to do with that. Do you guys prefer firm, uh, fixed price or TNM, and what's your thought process in going one way or the other? Um, we we uh, we price in two different me- methods. Uh, if if it's if it's project based and we can get our fingers around it uh, and we can describe it uh, uh, and do it, then we'll do a un, um, a bid. It won't, this, it's going to cost you this dollar amount. Any changes are then processed in, in change orders, which are, are mini cycles of the same thing. Most of these cases, however, are, are, are hourly. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, time and materials. Um, for, and, and so we, we you know, uh, and we, we offer, we, we actually sell in, in individual hours, but also blocks, and we provide some level of discounting for, for larger blocks. But most of this onboarding stuff, it's, um, it's not, there's too many uncertainties uh, in it. So we give ourselves some level of, of uh, wiggle room with a, a, a TNM, but as I said, there's, there's, uh, I have yet to find anyone, particularly on this high price sensitivity, low trust inbound area, that are like, yeah, sure, you know, however many hours it takes, it takes, right? Uh, so they're always going to want to have some sense of estimate, and I'm like, estimate. Hip shot. I've, I've used the I've, uh, most recently. I've used the cone of uncertainty, which is the, uh, the hurricane, to try and let everyone know that this is the, the range, and I've been wide range. But it's amazing. As soon as you put a range like that, you've now uh, um, drilled a not to exceed into uh, into a client's head. And if, if God forbid you exceed that, now it's like for every 15 minute increment, you're you're getting under the gun. So cool. that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. Thank you.